Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard Captain Fi, the Financial Independence Podcast. G'day! Welcome to an episode of Captain Fi, the Financial Independence Podcast, where I open the cockpit to some of the best and brightest in personal finance, as well as those who've reached or are on their way to financial independence. Before we get started today, remember anything on the show is provided for general information only and should not be taken as constituting professional advice. You should always do your own research when making any financial decision. Today, we're popping a bottle of champagne from the First Class Lounge to celebrate an awesome achievement with a Purple Life. Purple has just completed her journey to financial independence and has reached early retirement at age 30. Purple first heard about the FIRE movement back in 2013 when her partner discovered it on Reddit of all places. However, she didn't really think much of it initially. It was pretty challenging and confronted some of society's programming. So like most people, she then came up with a bunch of objections, excuses, and reasons why it wasn't for her. She was working in client services and advertising, and had actually managed to work her way up to achieve her dream job running her very own advertising and media agency within the firm. However, once she got there and had climbed the corporate ladder and finally achieved the dream job she had always wanted, she wasn't miraculously any happier than she was before. And it turns out the top job wasn't actually all it was cracked up to be. Reflecting back on the FIRE community, Purple started to read everything she could find on the topic and even began blogging about it back in 2015, where she talked about her experiences with finance, food, and travel. She also set a very ambitious goal to retire in 10 years, which would make that circa 2025, and she would be aged 35. Well, fast forward to today, by adopting a disciplined savings and investing regime, increasing her income, maximizing her tax leveraged accounts, and doing things like geo arbitrage, she was actually able to smash her 10-year goal right out of the ballpark and has been able to retire early in only half the time. She actually officially left her job only a few weeks ago, aged 30. What's more, she did so without needing to resort to the hustle culture and burning herself out. Rather than adopting a number of time-consuming small side hustles, she adopted a laser-like focus and put all of her efforts into professional development and advancing her career to to increase her income, all whilst maxing out her tax-advantaged accounts and maintaining a work-life balance. As a woman of colour, Purple has also had to overcome many issues that most of us could never understand, and she has reached FIRE without all of the privileges that many in the FIRE community have. Purple's life has also unfortunately been touched many times by tragedy with the loss of loved ones, which has really strengthened her resolve to retire early so that she could spend more time with those who truly matter to her. I'm really happy to be able to interview such an inspirational figure and learn some of the valuable lessons she has to pass on. So, welcome to the show and thanks very much for making time. Of course, thanks for having me. Purple, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, where you're from and your hobbies? And also, let us know, where does that name A Purple Life come from? (laughs) Well, I'm a black woman who was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia in the US and hobbies currently include writing on my blog (laughs) and has four or five years now, going on six actually. Um, and the name A Purple Life, um, kind of came to me randomly. I was trying to think of what a blog name would be and my hair is often purple. And so I decided to use this picture that's, that's on my blog. 
<clears throat> excuse me, the picture that's on my blog of me with purple hair. And I was like, oh, well, how can I integrate this in? And then a purple life came to me. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And to me, it means just kind of having a slightly different life, a life where you don't necessarily worry about what other people think and you can just do what you want. That's awesome. Now, I actually, I'm a professional pilot, so I, I have uniform standards that I need to um, maintain <laughs> at the moment. But you might be interested to know there was a time where I had uh, hot pink hair, which uh, did <laughs> it did go purple at one stage. Um, <gasps> what? But I'm back to I'm back to my natural color now. My next question: What got you on this trajectory? I'm actually a success story of a partner whose mind was changed. My partner came to me in 2013, I believe it was, after having discovered financial independence through Reddit, of all things. Um, he was browsing the personal finance subreddit and it linked him to the financial independence subreddit. And so he started sending me things like, have you heard about this? Like, what is this? People are retiring at 30. What's going on? I was like, ah, oh, well. <laughs> it was just like, thanks for that. I'm going to ignore it. Bye. Um, so yeah, I ignored him for two years. And then... Uh, I kind of used those two years to unintentionally go through all of the objections I had at the beginning, which are all the standard objections like, oh, why would I want to retire that early? What would I do? I just need to find my dream job and then I'll be happy. And I went through all of those. I found my dream job and I realized, nope, it's still not enough. And having a backup plan might be a good idea. <laughs> so I got into it. I can relate to what you've just said there because ever since I was a little boy, I always wanted to fly and flying has been my dream job, but I definitely want the option. So browsing r slash finance on Reddit is a bit of a pastime of mine as well. Is, mm -hmm. this, where you, is this where you picked up a lot of your, your financial independence skills or where did you learn more about how to become financially independent? It is where I kind of was pointed in the right direction, but from there, I think they have a resources or FAQ section um, with a list of books they recommend everyone read, blogs they recommend, and then I just dove into all of them. I read all the blogs, I got all of the recommended books from my local library, and I devoured them <laughs> over the course of like three to six months, and that's how I learned the skills needed um, to decide what my plan was going to be. That's epic. And for anyone who's listening, you can literally do exactly what Purple has done. This information is freely available. Uh, you can, there's a number of blogs. Um, we'll link some of the best in the show notes here. Um, most bloggers also have a recommended reading section. Um, and I'll link uh, back to both of ours as well in the show notes. So Purple, what has been your main financial independence investing strategy? Sure. So I'm generally um, a lazy person. So when I saw that there seemed to be one thing you could do that's really straightforward um, to reach financial independence investing wise, and it's basically just investing in stock index funds, that's what I did. And that's all I did. I am also lazy or I like to think, I like to think <laughs> of it as, no, I like to think of it as being efficient, right? To try and basically get the maximum uh, return for minimum time. Tell us a little bit about your career. So you mentioned earlier your dream career uh, and financial independence being a bit of a backup. What was your career like and did you have any other income streams on your path to FIRE? I worked in marketing my whole career, but at that specific time when I learned about financial independence, I worked in ad agencies specifically. And my dream job that I got was kind of an offshoot. I'd always been in client service and when I made a list of all the things that I wanted in my dream job and hilariously having clients was on the no list, <laughs> but I somehow found a job that took my skills in client service and advertising and allowed me to basically not have clients. We were building a mini agency within another agency. So starting completely from scratch, making big decisions and having fun while doing it. So I was super excited to get that job. And I had always told myself, like I mentioned, oh, once I get it, I'll be happy enough that I'll be fine getting up every Monday and fighting my way onto the New York subway. And then I wasn't. <laughs> so I realized even with this dream job that ticks all those boxes that I was 
the happiest I had been in a career. It wasn't happy enough for me to want to do that for decades more. I only had the income from my career. Um, and to answer your previous question, basically I got my dream job <laughs> and I had thought that if I got that, I would be happy enough to continue working for several more decades. And unfortunately, even though that job was absolutely wonderful, that was not the case. <laughs> so that's why I decided to go for financial independence, but going f with the same string of what did we rebrand it to? Efficiency. Um, I realized that I could make the most money by focusing on my career and job hopping and getting promotions. And I believe in the nine years of my career, I tripled my salary doing that. So I made a lot of money without having to also have the side effort of doing side hustles and kind of splitting my focus. Wow. So really narrowing that sort of laser like focus into your career um, and you're able to triple your income. That's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Thank you. So a lot of people do get caught up in the side hustle culture uh, and they feel like they have to constantly be doing something and it can be a bit of a trap because uh, we all know that a lot of side hustles aren't as lucrative as rightly you said, your actual professional career. So what industry did you work in? I worked in marketing and about the side hustles, I actually credit my mom to why I didn't go down that path because I watched her growing up in addition to her main job. She often had a second job teaching online and then also was trying to start businesses, kind of the standard side hustle plan. Um, and they never worked. <laughs> and I saw her work so hard on all of these things for them to just lose money because she would never make a profit. So I kind of was able to learn from her and skip that part. So I know that for some people, uh, business can be lucrative, but mm -hmm. even I'm not sure what it's like in the United States, but here in Australia, it's, it's something like eight out of 10, or it might even be higher, um, businesses fail. So a lot of them will um, will fail to make revenue and you know it does it can be a bit heartbreaking I've had a number of business ventures uh, collapse um, so I'm no stranger to to that kind of feeling unfortunately all right so ad agency and marketing so it sounds like you're probably perfectly positioned to be uh, to be writing online <laughs> kind of I mostly worked in client service um, so I didn't write most of the ad copy myself or design or anything like that. But I like to think that maybe working in that field for almost a decade gave me kind of an eye for things that look good, I hope. Well, <laughs> um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, they it's generally accepted that, uh, you know, 10,000 hours or 10 years working in an industry is what it takes to achieve mastery. Uh, and it sounds like by the end of your career, you pretty much had achieved that, especially by tripling your income, which I'm still gobsmacked about. <laughs> Let's go with that. I'm a master. Being able to boost your income to such a high level, that leads me perfectly into the next question is savings rates. So we, we all know that people with a higher income, uh, it is easier for them to typically maintain a high savings rate and thus uh, a shorter time to reach financial independence. What kind of a savings rate did you manage and how did this change on your journey? So the last few years, I was actually saving 77% of my after-tax income. So obviously I had a high salary for my age um, and also have relatively low expenses for reasons that we can get into. Um, but that really was obviously the highest. And prior to that, about in 2015, when I decided to go for financial independence, I originally ran all of my numbers and I was still living in Manhattan, um, planning to do so indefinitely, making about half of what I did when I quit my job this year. And my savings rate was about half of that, <laughs> understandably. And as a result, my uh, original timeline was, as you mentioned, 10 years retiring in 2025. Um, but since I was increasing my income, and I also left New York, which almost cut my expenses in half, um, I cut that time to five years, and that's how I was able to retire this year in 2020. 
That's uh, that's pretty impressive, like 77% savings rate. And a, a lot of people, yeah, might go, wow, that's just unachievable. But uh, like you mentioned, having a uh, moving state and being aggressive with career changes, making some meaningful life changes, you're able to really crank that number up. So that's pretty impressive. So you <laughs> mentioned you. you mentioned this at the start that uh, you were a fan of index funds. I know that in America, the investing landscape is slightly different. Um, most people would be familiar with the term Roth or 401k. In Australia, we have superannuation that uh, is very similar to a 401. So for you personally, which tools did you use? Like, did you favor a conventional brokerage account? Um, did you maximize your, your 401ks? Or how did you actually go about structuring your index investments? So I maxed out every tax advantage account I could um, to save on as much taxes as I could legally. <laughs> so I maxed out my 401k um, traditional IRA when I was still eligible for it. And then when I wasn't, I started maxing out my Roth IRA. In addition to that, I had some savings left over that I would also put in a taxable brokerage. So all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Now, it's also um, worth pointing out in Australia, when you contribute to these retirement schemes, you can't actually get them until you reach uh, what's called preservation age. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure what it's like in the States. Is it similar or can you access those funds earlier? It is similar, but there are ways to access it earlier. So standard age to be able to get into your tax advantage accounts is 59 and a half here. But um, there's something called a Roth IRA conversion ladder, which is basically when you leave your job, you're able to move your 401k into our traditional IRA. Um, and then you're allowed to slowly move that money into a Roth IRA. And if you do it slowly, you can actually go underneath our tax bracket. So that money is never isn't taxed then, aka it's never taxed. <laughs> um, so since my expenses are relatively low and at a young age, I'm not making any money, I'm able to do that. Um, and then down the road, just take that money. I believe it takes five years for my contribution to be eligible for me to touch it again. Um, so much closer than 59 and a half. Wow, that's impressive. Maybe we need to uh, bring in a conversion ladder in Australia because <laughs> I, I, would, I, would like I would like to use that system. So I guess the most important thing I wanted to talk about with you today, it's not something we've sort of discussed, but how was the pivot to early retirement? Like how did you pull the trigger and go, yep, I'm going to do it? You know, a lot of people talk about it, but when it comes to actually doing it, there's this fear and this tendency to just, just another year, just another contract, just another 100K in my brokerage before I'll do it. So mm -hmm. what, what gave you the confidence to quit your job and how has early retirement changed your life? So I'm going to flip it a little bit because... I didn't have necessarily the confidence. It was more driven by fear, actually. Fear of what would happen if I didn't quit. Because going down a morbid side street, I've lost a lot of people in my life. So the thought that our time is always slipping away from us every second, um, it's always in the back of my mind. So especially with everything going on in the world right now, the pandemic hitting, recession, everything, I was like, <laughs> I now more than ever don't know if I or the people I love will be there at all. <laughs> um, so that gave me, yeah, I guess I'll say confidence that it's time. I don't need one more year. I need to be with the people I love. And if for some reason this doesn't work out, luckily, even if the market never goes up another percentage, I have over 30 years <laughs> of my annual expenses right there until I need to figure something else out. Wow. Uh, I love the way you've reframed that. Thank you. And to answer your second question, <laughs> how it's actually changed my life. Um, it's been wonderful. I'm only on, I think it's week 
six when we're recording this, but my life is already completely different. When I'm sleepy, I take a nap. <laughs> when I want to go outside, I take a walk. I, I have complete control over my schedule. Um, my cousin is in Connecticut right now, and I previously moved to Georgia from Seattle. Lots of moving um, during this time. But she wanted some help with her new baby. And so I was able to say, okay, I'm going to come up with my mom and help you for three weeks. Like I've never (laughs) been, I've never even had a vacation that long before. So it's just been amazing to have the freedom to help my family if needed, travel across the country by a car since we are in a pandemic (laughs) and take the time to do that instead of a quick flight. It's just been great to have that freedom. Absolutely. Freedom to live your life the way you want to do it on your terms. I have noticed though, you're being quite active in these last six weeks (laughs) and your posting schedule has increased quite a lot. So uh, maybe a little bit more busy than ever in retirement. Yeah, I'm working on that. (laughs) So in (laughs) October, you're totally right. Um, I accidentally almost doubled my posting schedule. I usually post every Tuesday, but a couple of those Thursdays I snuck in some posts and it actually wasn't because some people were like, oh, you're bored already, huh? I was like, no, (laughs) it was because I wanted to um, record what was happening week to week. But I also had thoughts that I wanted to get out that were related to my last few days at work, which were at the very beginning of October. So when the thoughts were still fresh, I wanted to get them out there. But I have slowed down, at least posting wise. November, there's only one post a week. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have been way busier than I thought. I'm hoping that once I get through all of my to-do lists, like a lot of the things I have been doing are related to setting up my newly retired life, getting health insurance and all that stuff. So after that, hopefully (laughs) I can relax a little. Fingers crossed. I'll do my best. Uh, that's awesome. No, I know the feeling. I There's a lo- lot of um, articles that I want to po- uh, post on the, the Captain F5 blog. So Purple, one of the ways you're able to maintain a high savings rate and retire uh, at 30 was, your, was by cutting your cost of living. So if we could distill these down into your top three frugal hacks, what would they be? One would be to take the time to really reflect on what makes you happy, which I know is not super specific, but in reflecting on my journey, that's something I I never took the time to do until I got into fire. And that was almost halfway through my career. That was almost five years in. I was just doing things without thinking about it, dropping money left and right without thinking about, does this actually make me happy? I just assumed it did. (laughs) And when I took the time to think about it, I was like, actually, I would have preferred not to go to that concert and it was $500. (laughs) Or um, I would be even happier if I find a way to decrease a cost. For example, I switched my phone from AT&T to Republic Wireless and saved, well, AT&T was 90 bucks a month and Republic was 15 at the time. So um, compounding that over the next five years with that change is pretty significant. So taking that time would be my biggest frugal hack. So you also talked about uh, geo arbitrage or moving. So how um, how has that played in? Sure. So originally I had only heard of geo arbitrage in the international sense. So moving from your country to another country that has a lower cost of living, but allows you to keep your same standard of living. Um, But I didn't think about it. You can totally do that within your own country. I was living in Manhattan in one of the most expensive rental markets in our country and not questioning it. (laughs) But when we decided to go for fire, my partner and I made a spreadsheet, of course, because we're nerds of all the places that we possibly would want to move in the U.S. and the cost difference is staggering. Um, And we ended up choosing Seattle for many reasons, but one of the mathematical reasons were because it has about half the cost of living of Manhattan, but they actually pay the same salaries. So that really obviously helped me on my journey. And that's something I think everyone could do. I know it's hard. Like I was freaking out moving to the opposite side of our country, um, not knowing anyone having a job or an apartment or anything. It was terrifying. But it all worked out. (laughs) And it can be a great way to have the same kind of life you want for less. Now, I grew up in the bush um, out in rural Australia. Uh, And anytime I go home, I look at the cost of things at home. 
or the cost of rent in town uh, to the cost of like just rent in Sydney and it blows my mind. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, geo arbitrage within uh, your country and within your states as well can be a huge, uh, a huge way to propel you towards fire. You really can, especially with most of us or a lot of us working from home now. Um, that opens up the possibilities. Who knows yeah. where you are if you have Wi-Fi? <laughs> yeah, you just need a good uh, uh, background for your um, Zoom, right? You can... <laughs> just have so, a Mexican beach or something in the background. Oh, uh, yeah. Jealous. <laughs> so now I've always wanted to visit Seattle because, uh, of course, Boeing Field is mm -hmm. uh, just south of Seattle, and that's one of the biggest aviation factories uh, in the world. And, uh, you know, I love uh, big, heavy jets, heavy metal. So that's mm -hmm. definitely on my bucket list of places to visit. Yeah, definitely go. It's wonderful for that reason and many others. Um, it's also just cool because uh, we would also often see them flying, um, what's it called? I guess it's like test planes. I was like, what is that giant thing in the sky? It looks so weird. It's not painted. It's not an airline. Um, it's just cool to see. And then we'd be like, oh, what kind of what kind of plane is that? Is that experimental or is that new? So just another fun free pastime. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Seattle. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit of an it's a bit of an aviation uh, aviation mecca. So yeah, definitely definitely on my list. If you're uh, if, you, if you guys are still around, I'll uh, I'll drop you a line. <laughs> let me know. I don't know where we're going to be, but <laughs> let me know. When you first got into fire, you said you became a bit of a ravenous reader and you were devouring any piece of content on personal finance or investing that you could find. What are some of your top picks for the best personal finance investing or self-development books, podcasts or blogs? So, yes, I read all of them so that y'all <laughs> can save some time, though I did enjoy all of it. But after reading a couple books um, and blogs, I kind of was like, all of these are a little bit similar. That's interesting. So the ones that really stood out to me are, one, The Simple Path to Wealth by Jim Collins, um, which is also, if you prefer blog form, almost all on his website for free, which is jlcollinsnh.com. It's a stock series that I believe is on the top um, navigation bar. And that is the most down-to-earth explanation of investing in the U.S. that I've ever heard of. And it's absolutely wonderful. And so when my friends and family are like, what's this about investing? What's an index fund? I always send them to the, his blog because he explains the stock market as if it's a glass of beer. And I was like, okay, I got you. I understand what you're talking about. Um, so that's absolutely wonderful. And then also the other book that changed my entire mindset was Your Money or Your Life by Vicki Robin. And like I mentioned, I kind of have like a morbid history, but she reframed how I thought about money as the life force you give up for that money. And I was like, wow, yep. <laughs> That's super powerful. I'm not going to be wasting money on things that don't make that doesn't make me happy because I'm literally wasting my life. <laughs> um, so that's a fantastic book as well. Um, and those are my top two favorites. So look, um, it's been a blast chatting with you. Uh, I know you guys are uh, very busy, um, but I just thought I'd finish up by asking what are your top three tips for someone who might be just getting started on the path to financial independence? Sure. So top tip is to completely map out the life you want, cost it out and save for that. Like I mentioned, I originally was living in Manhattan. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm always going to live here. And that was the budget I set. I assumed I was always going to be spending a similar amount. And that's how I did it. But that's actually, it wasn't accurate because I didn't want to live there forever. <laughs> um, so instead, if I had figured out, oh, no, there are other places that have similar salaries but half the cost of living but much more natural beauty and things that feed my soul and all that stuff like Seattle, then in the beginning I could have known that my number was more like half a million um, U.S. dollars and it's a little more achievable. So that would be number one. Um, number two would be do experiments. So we talked about changing things like your phone plan. Um, something small, like do you actually enjoy going out to restaurants more than having friends over? 
I assumed I did. I was spending thousands a month on restaurants. Um, I was like, all right, let's do an experiment. Let's have a house party. I'll buy wine. I'll make dinner. We'll have apps. Like we'll do everything that the restaurant does and I'll cost it out. And oh, look at that. It spent, I spent like a 10th of what I would, even though I'm paying for everyone else as well. And I had way more fun. (laughs) So do little experiments like that. And sometimes they don't work and that's fine. So if you take something out of your life and you're like, I miss it, put it back in. And I think just doing that and kind of tweaking really can help you figure out what you want. And then number three would be kind of similar to the experiments, but fostering that idea is don't be afraid to be weird. (laughs) and ask for what you want. Like I mentioned, regretting going to a concert. Now if a friend asks, well, concerts aren't happening, pandemic, but if they were, now when friends would ask if I want to go to a concert, I'd say, no thanks, but what if we go on this nature trail instead? So it's not like I just want to save money, but actually doing what makes me happy and being upfront with what I would prefer has really helped me on my journey that way too. So Purple, awesome tips. I really appreciate you taking the time to discuss your journey. Uh, Again, congratulations on your early retirement. Thank you. If if the readers and the listeners want to uh, find out a little bit more about you or get in touch, where can they find you online? You can find me at my blog, purplelife.com. It has all my social media and email on there. If you want to hit me up, let me know what's going on. I'll make sure to leave uh, a link in the show notes uh, and people can go and check out your blog. I certainly know that uh, I'll be keeping a a keen eye on the latest releases and seeing how (laughs) uh, your next six weeks of early retirement go. Thank you. No worries. Well, look, thanks so much uh, for making time this morning. It's been awesome chatting to you and all the best uh, with your sister and the young one. Thank you. (laughs) I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks very much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Captain Fi Financial Independence Podcast. To read the transcripts or check out the show notes, head over to www.captainfi.com for all the details. If you have a question for the captain, make sure to get in touch. You might even make it on the airwaves. You can reach me online through the Captain Fire contact form or get in touch through the socials. I'm active on Facebook and Instagram as well as a number of online finance and investing forums. And finally, remember, the information presented on the show and the links provided are for general information purposes only. They should not be taken as constituting professional financial advice. You should always do your own research when making any financial decisions and make sure it's appropriate for your personal circumstance.